Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the worship of the living God. On this beautiful Sunday morning, our call to worship reminds us what is true every day, but especially good to reflect upon this morning, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas, he established it upon the waters. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. As we come before God in worship, let's go before him in prayer asking that he would bless us this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we do so joyfully. We do so expectantly. We long to come into your presence and to meet you here. So we pray that indeed your spirit would be present among us, active. Father, that your spirit would do the work that we need in our hearts, whether tearing down our idols or building us up, whether tending to our wounds or strengthening us. Father, we pray that our worship this morning would be holy, that it would be blameless, that it would be pleasing to you, that it would arise before your throne as a fragrant offering. And to Father, we pray that in our worship we would behold you. We would encounter you in your throne room and we would be changed by what we see. We would be changed by what we hear. Indeed, we would be changed by your Holy Spirit. We pray this earnestly eagerly, expectantly, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our opening song of praise. Praise the Lord the Almighty. same God who called us to worship, who we just sang about, the Almighty God who has befriended us. He greets us this morning with these words. He says to you, grace and peace to you 
from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. And all God's people said, Amen. Because God has so warmly welcomed us here this morning, let's take opportunity to welcome one another. As we move forward in our worship, having been called to worship, having been greeted by God, we encounter what His will is for our life. This morning we're going to use Psalm 15 for that purpose. It's a psalm of David. Uh, to cue you in on the theme that's going on this morning, we looked at Psalm 24 as our call to worship, a psalm of David, possibly penned in, uh, in direct relationship with our text for this morning. Here now we'll look at a psalm of David. For God's will for our lives. And then when we have our time of assurance of pardon, we're going to go to Hebrews. So there's two things happening here. Our text for this morning from 1 Samuel has to do with King David and has to do with Uzzah, who was a priest. So we're going to draw our elements of worship this morning, God's will for our lives, our assurance of pardon, our call to worship, all from things that were said by David or things that relate to the priestly office. So here in Psalm 15, this Psalm of David, interestingly enough, David is asking a question. He's saying, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? Who can enter the holy place of the Lord? Who can stand before him? And there are ten things that David mentions here. David says, he whose walk is blameless. And who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. This psalm, not only does it show us how to live in gratitude for what God has done for us, but this morning it also convicts us of our sin, of the places where we fall short, of the many, many ways that we have violated things on this list. We don't claim to be blameless. Not everything that we do is righteous, and so on and so forth. So as we reflect on that, as we encounter a holy God in worship, what do we do? We go before him in prayer. We go before him confessing our sin and seeking his pardon. Let's go before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we do so with penitent spirits. We know that we're sinful people coming to the presence of a holy God. And so we, like David, pray that you would have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. That according to your great compassion, you would blot out all of our transgressions. That you would wash away our iniquity. And that you would cleanse us from our sin. Father, we pray that you would cleanse us so that we would be clean. That you would wash us so that we would be whiter than snow. We pray that you would let us hear joy and gladness. That the bones that you have crushed, that the way that you have broken us, the way that you have shown us our sin that leaves us broken hearted, that those bones would rejoice. That you would hide your face from our sins and that you would blot out all of our iniquity. Father, we pray that you would show us our sin, but just bit by bit. For if you showed us the whole, if you showed us everything that you saw, all the things that we do, that we fail to do, Father, we know that we would be crushed under the weight of our indwelling sin. 
So, Father, we pray that you would help us to fight against it. We pray, Father, that you would help us to put the sin that lingers in us to death by the power of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you would create in us a pure heart, that you would renew a steadfast spirit within us, that you would restore to us the joy of our salvation, and, Father, that you would give us willing spirits to walk in your ways. Father, that is our hope and our prayer as we come into your presence this morning, that indeed, even today, we would be changed, that we would leave this place edified, holier than when we came. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Having come before God's throne, confessing our sin, looking to him alone for purification, Receive this assurance of pardon from Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, people of God, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, confidence to gather this morning as Jesus' body here in Sanborn, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, through Christ's body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere hearts in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from any guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So this morning let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let's stand together and sing of this great reality that we experience just as I am without one plea. As you're seated, we'll have uh, somebody come forward here for a special announcement this morning.
Um, three weeks ago, GEMS headquarters hosted a fundraising event. Um, they were a bit behind on their funds because of COVID. Several clubs closed or were put on hold. Um, so they had a fundraising event with several different you know, golf tournaments and things like that. One of the events was a program um, that they hosted on June 6th. And unbeknownst to Linda Oldenkamp, um, the Sanborn counselors and myself, we nominated her to be um, GEMS Leader of the Year, and she won. So um, I hosted all the ladies at my house that evening, and at the conclusion of the program, they called her name, and she was extremely surprised, and we were very honored to announce that Linda is the North American GEMS Leader of the Year. So congratulations, Linda. <laughs> I did want to just quickly showcase the reach that GEMS has. So can I have all the current GEMS counselors stand up? If you're a current GEMS counselor. And if you are a past GEMS counselor, can you stand up? If you've ever been a past, stand, I'll stay standing. And if you're currently a GEM or in GEMS, or going to be in GEMS someday, can you stand up? Thank you so much for all you do and um, the reach that Linda has had to I'm sure each and every one of you ladies. So this is a great program that we have and love to see it keep going. Thank you. Let's go to God in a time of congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you with much to be thankful for. This morning, we thank you for Linda and her work amongst this congregation through the GEMS program, through the many girls, the young women that she has had an impact on and touched the way that you've used her. We celebrate with her and rejoice that that work has been recognized by the broader GEMS organization, Father. We thank you for her and her work. We take joy in this celebration with her. Father, in that same way that Linda has helped to disciple our youth, we also celebrate the profession of faith of Levi Wester that we look forward to next week. Celebrate with his family. Celebrate with his friends. And he's come to a point in life where he seeks to publicly profess faith in you, to take on the full life of the church in a way that is life-changing, Father come to the church submitting to its authority to its discipleship to its discipline to the joys and the sorrows that come with it as we walk together as your body as we walk together in lives of service to you spurring one another on to love and good works Father too we rejoice with Lee and Susie Vintal and their 65th wedding anniversary. What an incredible milestone that is for them to celebrate. What a testament that is to your faithfulness to them, their faithfulness to one another. Father, we rejoice with them. We thank you for saints that you have given such long marriages to, such a time to be together, to be an example for us of what love and commitment look like, we know that not all 65 years have been easy, that there have been arguments, disagreements, but Father, that that covenant relationship remains strong when it is founded upon you, and people that are rooted in your word. We pray, Father, that just as we look and celebrate their anniversary, that we too, in our own marriages represented in this church, would be strengthened by it, would see that indeed it is you who provide that it is you who give us what we stand in need of. That it is you who are ultimately committed to us. And that our marriages are meant to be a parable of that level of permanence. Father, too, this morning we rejoice in the birth of Jackson Jay. Rejoice with parents, a healthy baby. We know what an incredible joy that is. Even as we pray this morning, Father, we hear the sound of children and infants, and we know that that is a wonderful thing to hear as we gather together, that those young people are gifts that you have given us, that they are responsibilities that you have given us to help to 
raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. This morning, Father, we pray that you would be with parents, that they would have wisdom to raise their children in the fear and knowledge of you. We know that that is not always an easy task. We know that sometimes our children vex us, they cause us great stress, they know how to push our buttons. So, Father, we pray that you would give us grace. We pray too, Father, that you would help those with children who are older as they seek to, to navigate the changes in parenting, the changes of responsibility as their children become young adults and eventually adults that are completely on their own, as what used to be more of an authoritarian relationship changes to one of, of gentle coaxing and of encouragement, of hopefully seeing seeds planted far earlier come to fruition. And Father, we pray to you for the children of our church that you would work in their hearts and that you would give them new hearts, regenerate hearts, hearts that trust in you alone so that one day, even those babies we hear babbling among us this morning would come like Levi to make profession of faith and grow up in the life of this church. Father, we too pray for those in our congregation, regularly in prayer for them, for one another, interceding for our fellow saints before your throne. And so this morning we lift up Larry and Kathy Hoffman, for Kendall Hoffman, pray for John and Tanya Hogers, for their children, Kirsten and Kendra. We pray, Father, good things for these people, for these members of our body. We pray that you would use them to edify us and vice versa, that we would be an encouragement to one another. To Father, we pray for you, or we pray to you for Verla Algersma. We pray, Father, that as she goes in for regular appointments, that everything would would be clear, that things would come back with good news, that you would continue to watch over her, protect her, to keep her free of cancer. Father, we pray for all those who struggle physically, who feel the effects of sin and decay in their body. Father, how we long for that day when we will have resurrection bodies that are no longer subject to to death, to sickness, to struggle, to pain. Father, we ask that you would instill each in each one of us a hope and a longing for that day, even as we experience the, 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 the slow decay of our bodies here on this side of eternity. Father, as we think of sickness, as we think of Ultimately, the death that awaits each one of us, we also come to you rejoicing. Rejoicing that um, the systemic dismemberment of children before they're born in our nation has taken a, a huge step backward. That the Supreme Court in this country overturned Roe v. Wade. We thank you, Father, for that blessing. We thank you for that common grace that has been bestowed upon our nation in this moment. And Father, even as some of us celebrate, we realize that our, our congregations, our body, your body, Father, is not monolithic politically, that all too often each of us gets wrapped up in partisan politics, and that all too often our political identities come far above and are far more noticeable than our identities as children, adopted children of the Heavenly Father. So, Father, we pray for unity in your body. We pray that we can all rightly celebrate life protected. But, too, Father, that we realize that we have a responsibility as your people to care for the vulnerable, to care for the least of these, and to do our part in that work, to do our part in our communities and in the furtherance of your kingdom. Father, we pray that as we continue in our worship this morning, that you would bless the offering that we give. Indeed, that you would bless the ministry of this church, that you would bless the ministries of its missionaries, that you would bless the work of World Renew. 
Father, we pray that you would use the gifts we give and that you would multiply them greatly. And Father, we pray that even as we give, that you would give us glad hearts, that you would give us open hands, and that you would give us joy in our giving. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll receive our morning offerings. It took me a while, but I finally connected to the dots as far as why there's stuffed goats at the front of the sanctuary. I wasn't going to ask, but as we prepare to approach or hear God's word this morning, let's ask that he would bless the reading of his word. Father, we come before you eager to hear from you hear what your word would have for us this morning. So, Father, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, that you would give us ears to hear, and that you would give us hearts that are receptive to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text for this morning is 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 1. Excuse me, 2 Samuel 6, verses 1 through 15. 2 Samuel 6, verses 1 through 15, can be found on page 266 in your pew Bible. The ark brought to Jerusalem. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of the God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, 
Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there besides the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez, Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and everything he has, because the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all of his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. This morning our text features four main characters, and these four main characters will help us to see what is at work, what's going on within this text. The first character that we encounter this morning is David. And David is mentioned immediately in verse 1. He's the reigning king of Israel, the relatively new reigning king in Israel. And he just finished a series of battles against the Philistines. Now, because of David's reliance upon God continually for guidance in these battles, God had given his enemies into David's hand in a way that was much more decisive than Israel had before. David was able to strike down the Philistines in a way that was much more decisive than the Israelites had been to, had been able to before. We see that here, in defeating the Philistines, God was using David to take care of the unfinished business that he had begun all the way back in the time of Joshua and then the Judges. He was using David to finally defeat the Philistines, to to clear the land of some of Israel's enemies. And so it's on the heels of this string of victories that David sets out to deal with more unfinished business. And that brings us to our second character, if you will, and the most important character in our text. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Lord. In Exodus 25, God gave Moses detailed instructions detailed instructions on how to construct the ark. It was made of acacia wood, and then it was overlaid with gold. It had golden rings affixed to it in order that poles could be used to carry it from place to place. And on its top were two cherubs, two golden cherubs, two angels, each with wings extended. And they overshadowed what was called the mercy seat. The place where God promised to meet with his people. God's footstool, if you will. You see, this was no ornate coffee table, not some luxurious piece of furniture. Rather, it was something, a physical object with which God Almighty attached his presence in a special way. Now David's unfinished business is to return the ark to its proper place in Jerusalem, in the tabernacle. So that task, returning the ark to Jerusalem, it should prompt us immediately to ask the question, where has the ark been? Where has the ark been? And why isn't it in the tabernacle? Why isn't it in the temple where it's supposed to be? Now, the portion of Israel's history between Joshua and King Saul is referred to as the time of the judges. And during this era of Israel's history, God raised up judges like Deborah, Gideon, and Samson to deliver his people from their enemies. And one of the major themes during this time period, in fact, the last verse in the book of Judges itself, summarizes the era well as it says... 
In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that's what happened to the ark. Because everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In 1 Samuel 4 we see two of Eli's worthless sons deciding to do what's right in their own eyes and take the Ark of the Covenant and bring it into battle as some kind of good luck charm. If I bring this with me, then God has to bless me. He has to give us victory. If we simply possess this object, this good luck charm, we can, we can twist God's arm into doing what we'd like. And it's during this, this exercise in futility, this this doing what is right in their own eyes, taking the ark of the Lord out to battle, that it's captured by the Philistines. But the Philistines soon find out that they don't want anything to do with the ark of the covenant, with the presence of God, because the Lord almost immediately afflicts them with tumors and a plague of mice while they possess the ark. With tumors and a plague of mice while they possess the ark. So it's finally then that the Philistines, they say, we've, we've had enough of this. We don't want anything to do with it. And they send the ark of the Lord on a cart led by two cows that had just calved. And it's a test because these two cows that have just calved, they shouldn't want to leave their calves. But those two cows, they thought nothing of their bawling calves and they walked straight back to the land of Israel. Straight back to the land of Israel with the Ark of the Lord on the cart behind them. So that's how the Ark of the Covenant had come to the house of Abinadab. It had come led by two cows. You see, Abinadab was a priest. He was a member of the tribe of Levi. And the Ark came to his home, and it was there for quite some time, likely around 20 years. And there it remained until the events of our text this morning. Now all of that is to say that David's second item of unfinished business is to return the ark to Jerusalem. David has set about to bring the ark back to Jerusalem from the home of Abinadab. As we continue this morning, we're going to see that the ark of the covenant brings judgment and it brings blessing. Those are the two main points of this sermon, that the presence of God in our story, specifically, the Ark of the Covenant brings judgment or it brings blessing on all who it encounters. That the presence of God brings judgment or the presence of God brings blessings on all who it meets. So now that we've come to the house of Abinadab, we're ready to meet the third character in our text, Uzzah. Uzzah was one of Abinadab's sons who was involved in the transportation of the ark back to Jerusalem. You see, as part of this procession, David had gathered 30,000 of the chosen men of Israel. He understood that this was a, an important task, something very special, something very significant. So he, he fittingly gathers the choice men of Israel, 30,000 of Israel's mighty men. In our text, it continues on to describe the Ark of the Covenant in the following way. It introduces the Ark by saying, The Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim of the Ark. The account of this story in 2 Samuel, it's, it's stressing the importance of what's happening. This is momentous. It's monumental, a significant step in the life of Israel. And in fact, it will be a noteworthy accomplishment of young King David. That's why there are 30,000 important people gathered. That's why they're celebrating with songs, with instruments. That's why the description of the ark stresses, emphasizes, that the presence of the Lord God Almighty is tied to this object. That he is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. It's a momentous, a grand, a memorable, a significant occasion. But Uzzah does not have regard for the momentousness of the occasion. As you'll recall, the Ark of the Covenant had been in Abinadab's house for quite some time, and evidently Uzzah and his brother had become quite familiar with it. 
and their familiarity with the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God Almighty, bred contempt for it. We read that they put the Ark of God on a new cart to transport it to Jerusalem. And as we, as we read this text, we're often somewhat impressed. Right? We're impressed by the newness of the cart. Oh, isn't that nice? It's clean. It's new. What a nice thing for them to do, to put it on a new cart. When what we should be thinking, what we should be experiencing, is, is abject horror. Right? It's like, it's like watching a horrific accident unfold before your eyes, and no matter how much we cringe... No matter how much we see the crash that's coming, we just can't look away. Remember in Exodus 25, God had given Moses careful instruction to fashion golden rings on the ark so that it could be carried on poles inserted into the rings. God then came and he doubled down on that instruction in number 7 when he tasked the sons of Koath, these special Levitical family, with transporting the Ark of the Covenant on their very own shoulders. Now what we've seen from Uzzah so far has been disregard for God's instruction. And it will get worse. As David and all the house of Israel, they're celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals, they then come to a threshing floor. And it's there that the oxen, they stumble. And the cart lurches. So Uzzah puts out his hand to steady the ark, to prevent it from falling, from falling to the ground, to the dirt, to the mud. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down, and he died there besides the Ark of the Covenant. Uzzah, in the presence of God, committed the heinous sin of presumption. Uzzah assumed that his hand, his hand was less polluted, less dirty than the earth. Uzzah the Kohathite, he knew how the Ark was to be transported, He knew it was to be covered. He knew it was never to be touched by anyone but the high priest. And David was angry. David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And if I'm honest with you, I often feel the same way that David does. In this account, in this act of God, it seems at first like an explosion, like an overreaction. Like God is in some way flying off the handle at Uzzah. R.C. Sproul in his book, The Holiness of God, he helps us pull back the curtain and see the true dynamic at play. He says, Uzzah was not an innocent man. He was not punished without a warning. He was not punished without violating a law. There was no caprice, no irrationality in this act of divine judgment. There was nothing arbitrary or whimsical about what God did in that moment. But there was something unusual about it. The suddenness of the execution and the finality of it takes us by surprise and at once shocks and offends us. Uzzah experienced the presence of God in judgment. Swift, immediate, final judgment. The Lord of hosts, the Lord God Almighty, whose footstool is overlaid in pure gold, broke out against him on account of his sin. So David was angry. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. There are a few psalms that are commonly associated with the events surrounding Uzzah's death. Psalm 132, Psalm 68 and possibly even Psalm 24, our call to worship this morning, where David asks, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He who has clean hands. David had seen, had witnessed what happened when dirty, 
impure human hands came into the presence of God. And so it is that David refused for a time to take the ark into Jerusalem. He was angry and he was afraid. And because David refused to take the ark into Jerusalem, we're finally ready to meet the fourth main character in our text this morning. Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, Obed-Edom was an Israelite, a member of the priestly tribe of Levi. He's called the Gittite because he lived near the city of Gath. And the ark of the Lord was taken into Obed-Edom's house for three months. For three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom. Now, there's some scholarly debate surrounding the exact identity of Obed-Edom. But it would seem that he is a priest, and he might even be a Kohathite, one of the families of the Levites that was in charge of moving the ark. We know very little else of Obed-Edom, or what even went on in his household during the three months that they took care of the ark. But the one thing that's emphasized to us in our text is that the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his whole household during this time. Obed-Edom experienced God's presence for blessing and not for judgment. His faithful care of the Ark of the Covenant, his regard for the presence of the Lord, resulted in blessing upon him and his whole household. And in fact, that blessing was so big that it was noticeable. That blessing was noticeable, so apparent in fact... That someone felt the need to come and tell King David, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of the Lord. And that caught David's attention. That caught David's attention. So once again he resolves to return the ark of the Lord to Jerusalem. And this time he's much, much more careful. The people were much more careful in the presence of God. We read that when those who bore the ark had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened calf. First of all, we see that proper care is being taken in transporting the ark. It's being borne upon the shoulders of the Levites, transported in the way that God intended it and that he had commanded the Israelites two years ago. First of all, we see that they are being very careful in transporting it. But second of all... We see lavish, extravagant measures being taken to convey just how important the ark of the Lord is. Did you catch that detail in the text? Every six steps, they would sacrifice an ox and a fattened calf. Think about that for a moment. The house of Obed-Edom was near Gath, likely a little over three miles away from Jerusalem. Three miles away from Jerusalem. It takes the average person approximately 2,000 steps to cover a mile. So the quick math there is that there are 6,000 steps from the house of Obed-Edom to Jerusalem. That's 1,000 oxen sacrificed. 1,000 fattened calves. Every six steps. Every six steps. An oxen and a fattened calf are sacrificed, are slaughtered. Think of all that expense. Think of all that hassle. Think of all that bloodshed. All to communicate reverence and awe in the presence of the Lord. And David is well rewarded for the care shown as the ark is transported to Jerusalem. David, we're told, wears a linen ephod. He's wearing the pure vestments required of the priests. And he celebrates before the Lord with all his might. David and the people, they show great regard for God's presence in their ritual, in their sacrifice, in their joy, and in their celebration. They experience the presence of the Lord for blessing. But the Lord was not done blessing David. Just a few short verses later in 2 Samuel 7, God establishes his covenant with David, telling David that God would establish his throne forever. That he would always have a descendant to sit upon the throne. 
What an incredible promise to David. What a lavish blessing from the Lord. 2 Samuel 6, the story of Uzzah and the ark, it clearly focuses our attention on the presence of God. Throughout this text, we've seen that the presence of God is never neutral. It's never benign. If you remember in the case of the Philistines, who had captured the ark decades ago, and now in the case of Uzzah, disregard for God's presence brings about judgment. God dealt quickly, though not unjustly, with each for their sin, for their immorality, for their disregard for his presence. But in the case of Obed-Edom and in the case of David, God dealt graciously with them for their reverence and their regard for his presence. God dealt with them lavishly, pouring about blessing upon them. The presence of God for judgment. The presence of God for blessing. We've used Psalm 24 in our worship service this morning as the call to worship. We've noted how David very possibly penned these words in thinking of Uzzah's death, asking who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who may come into God's presence, into his holy place. Who can experience your presence, God, for blessing and not for judgment? Who can experience God's presence presence for blessing and not for judgment. And that question leads us into two ways to apply this text to our lives this morning. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Each time we come together to worship, we're first called to worship. And then we're greeted by God. In our corporate worship, we're very intentionally coming into God's presence. Now, unlike with the Ark of the Lord, with the Old Testament tabernacle and temple, God no longer ties his presence to a physical object or a physical place. Now, rather, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God ties his presence to a gathering, to a body of people. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So we're gathered here this morning in the name of Christ. We're called into the presence of God. We're greeted by Him. And this morning, are we experiencing God's presence for judgment? Or are we experiencing it for blessing? Traditionally, we lay out our worship service and some of the elements within to seek to ensure that we are experiencing God's presence for blessing. If you look at your, your bulletin, that is largely the same every week. When we come into worship, we're called by God, we're greeted by God, and then we go into a time of confession and a time of assurance. We confess our sin, our moral failings, that we, like Uzzah, have dirty hands. And we do that very intentionally, because we need to be reminded that we are impure creatures coming into the presence of holy God. That we're impure creatures covered only by the purity of Christ. And that by his atoning work do we come here with clean hands. In doing so this morning, let us be sure to avoid Uzzah's failures, Uzzah's mistakes. The ark of the Lord was in Uzzah's father's house for 20 years. In that time, he became very familiar with it and eventually took it for granted. We, too, in coming into the presence of God in corporate worship week after week, month after month, year after year, some of us for decade after decade, can become all too familiar and nonchalant with what is happening here, what's going on this morning, what we are in fact doing. We take it for granted. And we don't appreciate that we indeed are coming into the presence of God Almighty. Uzzah also was very practical. He needed to transport the ark. And a cart drawn by oxen was a logical way to do it. It was his preferred way to do it. After all, it had worked for the Philistines some 20 years ago. And we're often tempted to think in the same way. When we consider God's presence, corporate worship, and the elements thereof, it's easy for us to simply think about what gets butts in the pews, what people like, 
what our own preferences are. But we should first of all be concerned with what God has told us about his presence and how he would be worshipped. Whether we deem it practical or not. Because we too want to experience the presence of God for blessing, even if it means what the world would call excessive, over-the-top, and impractical obedience. Like David sacrificing an ox and a fattened animal every six steps. A thousand oxen. A thousand fattened calves. Imagine the bloodshed. And that leads us to the second, the final, and in fact the most important way to apply this text to our lives. Each of us gathered here this morning identifies in some way with Uzzah. That's not who we want to identify with in the text, but it is who we do identify with. We're sinners in the presence of God. And we come into God's presence with dirty hands and with impure hearts. But yet we're not struck down. We're not destroyed. So we ask ourselves, is it because we're better than Uzzah? Is it because our sins aren't as heinous as his? No. We're not destroyed because of the bloodshed. We're welcomed into God's presence because of Christ's bloodshed. Welcomed into the presence of the Lord because a priest, one far better than Uzzah, died in our place. When Uzzah died there on the fleshing, threshing floor, David renamed the place Perez Uzzah, meaning the outbreak against Uzzah. Unlike Uzzah, we're not struck down because of another place that we could call Perez Jesus. The outbreak against Jesus at Calvary. The Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, broke out against Jesus on account of my sin. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall come in to his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. That's me. That's you. All of us together, our hands cleaned and our hearts purified by the blood of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that this morning we would be experiencing your presence for blessing. That we would be blessed by this gathering of your people by your word preached, by prayers lifted, by your praises sung. Father, we pray that we would continue to dwell in your presence and that we would continue to experience your blessing as we claim and cling to the promises of Christ, his blood shed, his body broken, for the complete forgiveness, the complete remission of all of our sin. Father, what a glorious reality that we get to live in. What a great cause for joy, the ground of our hope, the foundation of our lives. Father, may we live in your presence and cling to your promise in the rest of this day and in the rest of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our song of praise, our song of application, Holy, Holy, Holy.
As we go forth into the world, God sends us with his blessing. He says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.